guys, welcome back to another video. Before we jump into this, if it's your first time here, you like daily gaming news, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you have been watching for a while, which I see a lot of you have been, make sure to hit the subscribe if you do enjoy what you see. But let's start off here. Let's talk about a new hire at a very high position here at Xbox, and that is the VP for Global Partnerships. There is a new person on board here with the Xbox leadership team. And that person is Leo Olib, who has been hired as the VP for Global Partnerships. Saying this here on X, excited to announce today I start as VP Global Partnerships at Xbox. Thank you, Lori Wright, Sarah Bond, and Phil Spencer for the opportunity to join such an amazing team with an incredible vision for the future of games. Let's go. Now, I don't know too much about him, but we do have a brief kind of look at where he was before in terms of gaming related jobs. And he definitely does have some experience here in the gaming industry. So he was at Facebook as the global director and senior global director for game partnerships for five years and eight months. And then after that, he was actually at YouTube as the head of of global gaming for two years and 11 months. And now he makes his way over to Xbox as the VP for global partnerships. So we'll see how he does and what other partnerships do come up around the world. We know Xbox is continuously trying to grow in the places where it just isn't popular, specifically in the Asian region, as well as just get lots of different partnerships that bring games over to Xbox Game Pass. And he will obviously have a major role in that and making sure that there's continuous deals and content and stuff coming with all of these different global partnerships. Now let's talk about some PSVR 2 because PSVR 2 released a year ago in February and it's really good tech. That's one thing about PSVR 2, the positive about it. The headset is awesome. The controllers are great. The actual rumble and stuff in the headset is really, really cool. The screens inside are, are nice. I have a PSVR 2 myself, but the issue with the PSVR 2 is that there's just really no games to play or at least the games that people were expecting, which were these big first party PlayStation games that we're going to utilize everything within the headset and make the purchase worth it. There's been nothing. There's been the game that launched with it, which is horizon call of the mountain. And then there was also Gran Turismo seven from their first party where you had the PSVR two mode implemented, which was actually very good. It was one of the best, I think racing VR games that you could play. It was very immersive, but Nothing really since then. And even at their latest showcase, people were expecting PSVR 2 titles to show up from first party PlayStation Studios, and it hasn't happened. And now we're seeing the effect of just really having nothing that exciting for the headsets to be able to play. We're seeing the effect here as Sony is reportedly pausing PSVR 2 production. They say you're to clear excess inventory. So it says after producing an excess of 2 million units of its latest virtual reality headset, Bloomberg is reporting that Sony is hitting pause on production to try and shift its unsold inventory. It launched back in February for 549 US dollars, which is an accessory to the PS5, which is actually already more expensive than the PS5 itself, which is pretty crazy to think about that you'd be paying more for this accessory and you can only use it if you actually went on bought the console. Now, one thing they are trying to do, which they announced a couple of weeks ago, which will give this headset life, I do believe, and will give it legs where people will consider picking it up, even if they don't even have a PS5, is they are testing PC support. So this is going to be native PC support that PlayStation is allowing, not any hacks or anything going around the ecosystem of PlayStation. You're going to be able to use it on your PC. I'm guessing be able to play games via Steam and just give it a lot more life and a lot more content. And I would say make it actually useful and worth having because like I said, the tech in the PSVR 2, very good. It's a great headset. And for myself, I was always hoping they would open it up to PC and they are doing that now. So you could essentially, when this does eventually release, just go out and spend the money on the headset and not have to worry about getting a PS5. But we will see what PlayStation does with PSVR 2. Are they going to just completely abandon this thing from their own first party perspective once the PC support comes out and just hope that people will end up picking it up to use it with PC games rather than with the PS5? That will be something that is interesting to see because PlayStation isn't known for this. They're not open, known for opening up their ecosystem. They are pivoting now. Obviously, everything that has been happening, putting a lot more games on PC from the fact that we've seen their profit margins, just not where they have to be. They are opening up more now as they're being forced to. But this will be something that is going to have more effects in the future, I think, for more of 
the PlayStation accessories and stuff that do come out. Okay, let's jump over here to a really, really crazy story. And this has to do with Apex Legends. So Apex Legends, they were having their finals of the pro tournament over the weekend. And during the tournament, the actual competitors within the tournament themselves started getting hacked and nobody really knows what was going on here. It says here that if you are going to load up Apex Legends this fine Monday, you may want to hold off. An incredible situation arose over the weekend whereby pro players taking part in the North American finals were given cheats during the game remotely by an unknown party. There are videos out there you see it happening where the guy just starts getting hacked, has to leave the game, has no idea what is going on. They say, that's right, someone hacked Apex Legends and gave players in a private lobby wall hacks and aimbots in the middle of the game. And nobody knows what's going on, but the theories are that it is an RCE remote code execution, which would seem, they say, to stack up since it was an online tournament in a private lobby. Now, there is this debate going on as to, is it the game? Is it the anti-cheat? Nobody has figured this out yet and as we know easy anti-cheat is the system being used in apex legends and being used amongst many other games so that's kind of concerning because that would mean if it was the anti-cheat there's a lot of people out there that have this installed on their computer where there would be this exploit but easy anti-cheat does tweet this out now it's not definitive they just say we have investigated recent reports of a potential rce issue within easy anti-cheat at this time, which is the most important thing, we are confident that there is no RCE vulnerability within Easy Anti-Cheat being exploited. We will continue to work closely with our partners for any follow-up support needed. So, I mean, still don't know. It could be the Anti-Cheat because at this time is what they are saying. So in, in the future time, maybe they find more information and it does end up being them. But I mean, this is pretty crazy happening in the middle of a tournament. Nothing is safe anymore. Nothing is safe. Everything is getting hacked. You're seeing on YouTube across the board, all these major channels getting hacked as well. Like it's just crazy what has been going on recently. And now during the finals of a major tournament, the players themselves started getting aim bots that apparently wasn't them who were trying to put those in themselves. It was a different party that came in there and took over their account. Pretty crazy stuff there going on with Apex Legends and the hacking and anti cheese and all of that stuff. Okay, let's talk talk about uh, a acquisition here. And this time it's not an acquisition of a developer or a publisher. This is an acquisition in gaming that has to do with accessories. Two major third party accessory makers are merging into another gaming acquisition. This is a deal worth 118 million, and it is Turtle Beach which Turtle Beach is very famous for controllers, for headsets. I know them really for their headsets and many different products on Xbox and other brand and other consoles out there. They are acquiring PDP. They say this, the transaction combines two leading gaming companies with industry leading teams, significant product momentum and proven track records of delivering profitable growth. The transaction substantially grows the size of Turtle Beach, bringing PDP's leading gaming controller category to Turtle Beach will provide additional scale and create future development opportunities. Now, the question here is, is PDP still going to be around are they still going to label all of their stuff PDP? Because I think a lot of people know PDP for third party and getting rid of that would maybe have customers looking elsewhere. But so it says here, it remains to be seen if PDP will stick around as a brand under Turtle Beach or whether the name will eventually be phased out. But either way, Turtle Beach will soon own the names as another gaming acquisition takes hold. So the acquisitions, like I said, not just happening within software development and game development and publishers is actually now even happening within the accessories going forward and there are some pretty good accessories out there this day and age when it comes to these third-party devices and third-party controllers you have like power a you got turtle beach you have pdp their stuff there are some good accessories out there that you can buy that aren't first party devices for these consoles i remember back when with the older generations of consoles it was always just like the third party stuff was garbage like a lot of the mad cat stuff just I th thought at least that they were not very good at all. But I feel like in this generation now that we're getting this third party stuff. Yeah, it's not the same as the first party accessories out there, but they still have some pretty high quality stuff that you can go buy and save a bit of money depending on, I guess, what you're buying under their product line. OK, let's jump over here to this crazy tweet that I did see yesterday. Well, not the actual tweet itself, but the information within the tweet, which is pretty crazy. Hi-Fi Rush, as we know, is coming out onto PlayStation 5. And one of the things people are going to 
uh, always be talking about is the reviews. How are the reviews on the PS5 version of Hi-Fi Rush going to stack up against the Xbox version? Of course, it is a first party Xbox game being pushed onto the PlayStation 5. And if the game gets significantly better reviews, although the game was rated really high on Xbox, so it can't it won't ever be that much better. But if it does get better reviews, on playstation you're gonna have a lot of people there looking at xbox and saying hey they gave the better version of this game to the competitor platform that will just not look good and we already are seeing this now with the first review here for hi-fi rush from the website noisy pixel which gave it a 9.5 out of 10 and on xbox gave it a 9 but I mean, you could also argue that right now there's been a bunch of updates to Hi-Fi Rush. The game has been optimized even further than it already was. So maybe that's why they're giving it a higher score. It's like the definitive version of the game. And if they were to re-review it on Xbox, they would give it the same score. I mean, you could always have those semantic arguments. But I mean, Hi-Fi Rush generally, when it did come out, was almost in perfect condition. There were like no bugs or anything. It played great or ran great. So there was really nothing wrong with it. But we have this here. So this is a tweet from the Black Viking saying, so you either played at release Xbox or PC launch or you didn't. I am so confused. And that is because the reviewer tweeted this out when Hi-Fi Rush came out last year uh, saying played Hi-Fi Rush for the first time today. So this was this was last year in 2023 played Hi-Fi Rush for the first time today. Looks and feels great. Genuinely no complaints about anything except uh, the music has turned me off. To the point of refunding it not my type of music at all sadly neither the licensed or stream friendly tracks for me so this person tried playing it said it was great for everything except music and then decided to refund the game and then we get over here to yesterday where they put out the review this person reviews the game and says got to review hi-fi rush on playstation 5 didn't play the original release Surprised at how much I ended up loving it, especially since I don't like any of the music. Going to be an enjoyable, gradual plot. And you have to ask yourself, this reviewer here really did not give it a chance on either Xbox or Steam. I believe they actually ended up playing it on Steam. As they do say that they played, tried the original release on Steam and saying some stuff that they're getting threats and DMs. Anybody doing that is an absolute idiot. But saying they're getting threats and DMs, I only tried to read the original release on Steam for a bit before refunding it. I didn't experience it enough to really say I played it. Should have said I didn't play through it. That's my bad. So it kind of clarifies what is going on there. But again, getting threats is just absolutely absurd. But you got to look at this and think, why was this not given the same chance back a year ago versus now where it's completely fine giving it a 9.5 and would would recommend the game to everyone but last year when it was only released on xbox and steam there was no recommendation could only play it for two hours and then gave up on it just because of the music even though everything was great and it, this always goes back to the xbox tax and there's always that debate is there an xbox tax or not and my theory on this whole xbox tax thing is that just the reality of the situation is there are more PlayStation gamers out in the world. There are more PlayStation gamers who are game journalists and reviewers, and you have a natural bias towards one platform or the other. That is just something that is there. If it's where you play all of your games, you're more inclined to go into playing a game on the PlayStation 5 with a positive outlook versus going into playing a game on Xbox. If you don't play on that platform at all, you're probably going into looking at it with a negative outlook. So you're already kind of held back a bit from enjoying the game itself. And that's kind of what that would seem like to me. Probably one of the reasons why we're going to see more of this is that the game that they wanted to play wasn't on their preferred platform. So they probably just didn't want to put the time and effort into playing it. And they're, they were at that time last year wanting to play something else on their preferred platform. And now we have here, I would say a pretty good look at what that Xbox tax or whatever you want to call it, unconscious bias towards xbox is with a year ago not even being able to play it. i think it's like a two hour time frame on steam before you can return it to a whole to fast forwarding to yesterday to be saying it's one of the, it's a great game and we'll recommend it to everybody and we'll platinum the game just crazy because I, well, we're going to see a lot of this over the time that the reviews do come out for hi-fi rush on ps5 people always comparing it and this is the pr nightmare that xbox has to deal with by putting their games on to the competing platform like the playstation 5 all right let's jump over here and let's talk about 
Star Wars game. There's a Star Wars strategy game coming out. It looks like, I mean, Star Wars strategy games are always cool, but the question always is, how is this going to run on console? Because they're going to want to bring it to console with the different controls and stuff. And we have some more info here that this game will be using Unreal Engine 5. They will want people with experience working on console titles because they want to be able to have those controls in there. They say the game will aim to revolutionize strategy games through the lens of the Star Wars universe. The game was first announced in 2022 and is still in development after EA's layoffs and bit reactor and respawn entertainment are working on star Wars strategy games. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what this is all about. I do like strategy games. I like strategy games on console. If they have great controls, I mean, I'm playing unicorn overlord right now, which is awesome. The Halo Wars series had great implementation of controls there. So hopefully they can do something similar here, depending on the type of strategy game that this Star Wars game is. All right, let's end off here and let's talk about a new feature coming to Steam because I think this is awesome. And that is Steam Families, just making it really much easier to share your games with people who are part of your Steam family. It says here that they are excited to announce Steam Families available today via the Steam Beta Client. And Steam Families is a collection of new and existing family-related features, places both Steam Family Sharing and Steam Family View, giving you a single location to manage which games your family can access and when they can play. The biggest upgrade here that I think a lot of people will be interested in is the family sharing, which will just make it much easier for people to share their games. They say when you join a Steam family, you automatically gain access to these shareable games that your family members own, and they will also be able to access shareable titles in your library. The next time you log into Steam, the new family library will appear in the left column as a subsection of your games list, and you maintain ownership of your current titles when you purchase a new game it will show up in your collection best of all when you are playing a game from your family library you will create your own saved games or in your own steam achievements have access to workshop files and more and family sharing enables you to play games from other family members libraries even if they are online playing another game if your family library has multiple copies of a game Multiple members of the family can play that game at the same time for a more detailed look at how family members work. They have a bunch of FAQs. So it's a quick overview there of Steam families, but basically it's just going to make it easier for people to play games in each other's libraries. You can have different selections of adults and child within actual Steam families, set play times for them, have child purchase requests, and you can go and actually make sure in your Steam account to be a part of the beta under the interface section if you do want to see the Steam family beta show up. So pretty cool there. Uh, just an improvement overall on Steam family sharing and the Steam family view and stuff into what they are all now going to be calling Steam families. And the family option with this generation of gaming is absolutely needed, especially with all of these subscription services out there. The question I always have now is when is Xbox going to release Xbox Game Pass family where you're going to be able to pay a single fee and have like five Xbox Game Pass accounts, which would have made things just way better. But Steam here, I like what they're doing here with their new Steam families. But I will end the video there, guys. If you did enjoy this video, hit that thumbs up. If you're new here, hit that subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video.